Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today um, on today's webinar on scholarships, fees, and finance. Um, I'm Gabriella, and I'm the Americas and Caribbean Regional Officer at Middlesex University. Um, I was also a student at Middlesex not too long ago, so I can relate to many of your questions about scholarships, fees, finance, how to fund your studies, and all of that. Um, I'm also joined by two current students at Middlesex, and they are Divya Samani, hi, from India, and Yu Hui from Malaysia. Hi, thank you for joining us. Um, they'll also share some tips and tricks about budgeting later. Um, the webinar will last around 60 minutes, and we have a quick presentation followed by a Q&A session at the end. If you'd like to ask questions, please type them in the chat room box. Um, which should be on the right hand side of your screen um, and the webinar is being recorded so we'll share the recording and presentation slides with you on a follow up email in the next day or two. All right, so let's get started. So today we'll be talking about these three things scholarships, how to pay the deposit and tuition fees. Um, we're also going to talk about budgeting your money whilst a student at Middlesex University. And um, this information is going to be useful whether you're a first year student, um, undergraduate student, or a mature master's student, or even PhD students. Um, so let's get right into it and talk about scholarships. So when, it's come, when it comes to scholarships, um, there are a few things to keep in mind. We do give scholarships, and oftentimes it will be as a reduction to your tuition fees. Most of them are merit based, but some are on personal circumstances. You can apply for more than one, but you can only be awarded one. So you'll keep the one normally with the highest value on your record. This is in case you earn two or three scholarships, um, you'll keep the one with the highest value. Um, and you can take a screenshot of these links so you can know where to access these scholarships if you're anxious and don't want to wait, oh, wait a, a day or two after we send out the recording. Um, but also every regional office normally has a budget for regional awards. Um, please remember that these are very competitive and you should aim to apply as soon as possible after receiving um, an offer from the program. So basically that's the dynamic. You don't apply to the pro you don't apply to the scholarships first and then apply to the program. You first apply to the program, right, to the university via UCAS or the regional office or directly if you're a master's student. And after you get an offer from the university, that's when you can then apply for scholarships. Um, so for those of you who are international students, like our two beautiful student ambassadors, and like I was myself when I was a student, um, you have the option to look into achieving scholarships. Um, these are for master's degrees only. It's one of the best scholarships and it includes everything from visa fees, airfare, um, a monthly stipend for living expenses, um, accommodation, and of course, the tuition fee. Now you must know that this process begins a year before the start of your program. So this means that if you apply for achieving scholarship in 2021, you'll be coming to Middlesex in 2023. Applications usually open in August and close early in November. So um, please follow their social media and look into the, their website regularly for the most updated information. Um, since it's earlier in the year, this is a great time to start researching achieving applications, um, to start um, you know, preparing your profile, um, becoming a good candidate for those scholarships. And as soon as they open up in August, you'll have the opportunity to apply. All right, so if you're from a country in the Commonwealth um, and can demonstrate that you're from a disadvantaged background, then you can also access the scholarship here, um, the Commonwealth Scholarship. It is again for postgraduate studies only, and their criteria is only for degrees in certain development subject areas, such as science, technology, um, technology for development, for example, global peace, security, governance, those types of degrees. Um, and if you're from the EU or EEA, then this is, um, as a result of Brexit, unfortunately, you will now be charged international tuition fees and can't access, <coughs> I'm sorry, um, you'll be charged international tuition fees, can't access British student loans, but fortunately, 
we at Middlesex offer these scholarships, which allow you to pay a tuition fee that is very close to home fees and very far from the regular international tuition fee. So as shown on screen, um, undergraduate students would pay um, 9,500 postgraduate students, um, just 250 more than UK fees. Um, please note that this is an automatic scholarship that you won't need to apply for, and it's only for students who have an EU or EEA passport and are also permanent residents in the EU and EEA. If you have not been living in the EU, then this does not apply to you. Now, if you meet this criteria and are in the UK on a settled or pre-settled status, um, then you can disregard the scholarship as you will obtain the UK fees. All right, so let's talk now about university fees and other associated costs. So things that you must consider when budgeting, obviously, first and foremost, tuition fees. Um, then you can also think of any field residential trip, if not already included in your program. At Middlesex, many residential trips are included in your tuition fees, so you don't have to set out as much um, for that. You can find more information on your program's profile or you know, on the first day uh, when you are at lectures. Normally, that's when your program leader will explain everything. Um, you also need to budget for accommodation. So our halls of residence start at somewhere between, um, normally I start at something like 158 or 160 pounds per week. And private rented accommodation um, is available um, at mdx.ac.uk slash accommodation. Um, so it can give you a good idea. You can go online there and just check out the prices um, for 2022. Um, also consider living expenses. So things like food, travel, entertainment, um, laundry cards, which a lot of students forget you will need to pay for your laundry um, uh, for the washer and the dryer, um, mobile bill, um, telecommunications, right? If you like to go to the gym, then you have to pay for a gym membership um, and all, all those little things that are included in living expenses. Um, so be mindful of that as well. And also be mindful that if you're an international student, the living expenses in London might be very different from the living expenses at your home country. They may be higher or they may be lower. Um, what you need to do at this point is just prepare for that um, and make sure that you have the funds or that you can collect the funds by the time you start university. Um, if you're applying for a pre-sessional English course, then you should also budget for that um, extra fee of tuition and living expenses associated to that. If you need a student route visa, then you're expected to have the first year's tuition fee plus 12,006 pounds in a bank account that is yours or your parents. Um, and you can check more on this at www.mdx.ac.uk slash visas. So keep that in mind if you're a student who needs, if you're an international student who needs a visa. Um, and also I wanna make a note here that a number of countries are exempt from having to show these funds upon visa application, but we always advise students to have evidence of these funds, you know, have proof of these funds, but a bank account showing these amounts, just in case the requested um, proof of funds in the case that you've applied for a loan then you don't need such bank statements. The um, federal loan, for example, will do. All right, so some things that we include as part of your tuition fees are um, well being and academic support, employability advice, ebooks, and e journals. And um, I think we're, if not the only, probably one of the first universities who provided students. Um, ebooks, free ebooks <laughs> for each and every one of their modules. Also, the university has enough books um, in the library for students to loan for up to 20 weeks at a time. Again, I was a student and it's, it feels so good to not have to worry about budgeting for books specifically, although we do encourage if students are able to purchase their books, that's great. But if that's not something that you can budget for, then at least you know that you won't run into troubles with that. The university has enough books that you can loan up to 20 weeks at a time. And also um, we give free eBooks for each and every one of your classes or lectures. 
Um, another thing that we include, uh, which includes that value for money is online training, laptop loans, printing. Um, yes, there is free printing um, on campus. And especially if you're a postgraduate or, or student who's doing their dissertation, that is a lot, a lot of pages that you'll need to print at some point. Um, if you stay at a hall of residence, then all bills are included. I'm talking electricity, Wi-Fi, heating, um, water, even a weekly cleaner for the shared spaces like the kitchen, um, hallways, living room. All of those are included in your, um, in your fees. Um, so I think it's honestly a great value for money. All right, so let's talk about paying your deposit. So paying your deposit is the final part um, or the final step <clears throat> to, secure, um, to secure your place at Middlesex University. Um, and after which you, <clears throat> sorry, and after which you can sit back, you can relax and then wait for your CAS if you need a visa. Um, so CAS statements, CAS stands for Confirmation of Acceptance of Studies. CAS statements do, will not be sent out to students who have not paid a deposit or provided evidence of having been granted a loan. Um, so that's why it's important to pay your deposit as soon as you know that you want to come to Middlesex, as soon as you um, receive an unconditional offer status, as soon as you're able to. Your deposit will be stated on your offer letter, and it can go from a thousand pounds up to 50% of your first or only year's tuition fee. It really varies. So please look back to your offer letter, see how much um, deposit you need to pay. Um, if you wish to defer your place, then you'll be asked to complete the application process and pay the deposit before your application is deferred to the next year. So be mindful of that as well. Deposits are non-refundable except if you are denied a student visa. So if you pay a deposit, it is expected that you will be coming to Middlesex University, all right? Um, just keep those things in mind regarding the deposit. Now, how do I pay my tuition fees? Half of your yearly tuition fee should be paid upon enrollment. And the deadline is normally at the end of the month of enrollment. So at the end of September, if you're a September starter or at the end of January, if you're a January starter, of course. So it really depends on your start date, but normally the rule of thumb is at the end of that month is when you have to pay at least 50% of your full year's tuition fees. You can pay tuition fees by a lot of ways except for cash. So you can pay uh, tuition fees by bank transfer, you can pay it over the phone with a credit or debit card, or our preferred way, which is online payments with most major credit or debit card. The reason why we prefer that is because you as a student, you're able to get uh, a receipt right away. Um, just email to you seconds after payments. Um, and we will cover the bank account information just a bit, but do not stress about not having bank accounts just yet, because this is part of what happens during the welcome week. Um, and you'll receive more information about opening a bank account in the UK closer to enrollments. I just had a student yesterday very worried about not having um, a bank account in the UK. And of course they don't have it yet because they're not living in the UK. So those are things that come after you enroll in fact. So don't worry about not having a bank account just yet um, in the UK, but do have those um, tuition fees and accommodation fees beforehand. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the student budgeting. Um, this information will be very useful to you if you want to take notes or if you want to wait for the recording, then do that, please. Um, so living costs. These are some of the estimated costs of living, um, which again, may vary a lot from, or may differ a lot from your country of residence currently. So um, accommodation, bills and insurance, just expect it can go anywhere from 550 to 800 pounds per month. Food and household items are normally around 80 pounds per month. So normally like 20 pounds per week. Um, then think about leisure, sports, entertainment, right? These are part of the things you want to include in your budget. Um, and it looks anywhere from around 95 pounds each month. 
Um, local transportation, if you live by the university and you're just walking to and from the university, the local transportation can be very low. Um, or it can go normally from 50 to 100 pounds each month. Also be mindful um, that you're able to get a student oyster card for transportation, which gives you about, um, I think, a 30% discount on weekly, monthly, seasonal, or yearly travel passes. Um, and then also think of one-off costs that normally um, happen once a year or every so often in the year, not very, um, not month to month. And these are things like flights to and from your home country, treats for yourself, like, um, I don't know, a, a very special um, clothing item that you want to treat yourself with um, on your birthday. Um, things also like um, traveling around Europe. It's something that our students do and that I remember I did a lot and I enjoyed a lot because although it is very easy to commute to a lot of parts in Europe and even the world, um, these are things that you need to budget for, right? Budget for the trips, the entrance tickets to all of those. So the London Eye, for example, it's something that you're not going to do every month, but that you will do um, one time or maybe twice in a year. All right, so those are things that you have to budget for. Also be mindful, and here I want to write a huge asterisk. These living costs will vary. You could be living more extravagantly than this or more um, affordably than this. And it all depends on your lifestyle, okay? It really all depends on your lifestyle. That's the rule of thumb. Um, in the same way that in your city, you could be living towards the most extravagant end or the most affordable end, that's the same way in which you can um, expect life to be in the UK while you're a student. All right, so just keep those things in mind. Um, and here we have some costs of rent for um, a few years ago, so you have an idea of what to expect. Um, and here we have, for example, our five halls of residence. That's Usher Hall, Platt Hall, Ivy Hall, and Olympic Way. More accurate um, to, not tuition fees, more accurate fees can be found on our website. Um, and it's important to know that we do 40-week contracts and 50-week contracts in Ivy Hall and also at Usher Hall, but um, you would need to discuss that with the accommodations team. As I mentioned before, bills are included, so consider gas, electricity, internet, all of that to be included. All right, now opening of bank accounts in the UK. Let's talk a little bit about that. So opening of bank accounts in the UK can take a few weeks, so please allow for enough time and adjust your expectations. You can also try and apply online to speed the process. This, I would say it is wise to bring a traveler's check or small amounts of cash with you in case there are delays but many places accept cards as a form of payment. You can see the main bank on screen, but an alternative um, bank and a very popular bank is an online bank called Monzo, M-O-N-Z-O. So go check that out when you can. Um, it's very accessible, very easy to join. Um, and it's something that our international students use a lot and enjoy. All right, so normally banks will require an ID or passport with a visa. If you're an international student, um, you would also need proof of address in the UK. So that's normally why you need to first arrive in the UK prior to opening a bank account. Um, and you will need proof of studies, like your MDX offer letter or your student ID. Um, once you become a student and you have access to the student portal, you're able to um, download a bank letter, it's what we call it, which is normally um, what students provide in order to address all of these documents that they need to provide. All right, and that is pretty much all from my side. I will now leave you with one of our student ambassadors. Um, her name is Divya. Divya, what can you tell us today? Thank you so much. So before starting, I'll just give a brief introduction about myself. So I'm Divya Samani, I'm from Mumbai, and I was a September intake last year, and I'm doing my master's in digital marketing. I have worked in India for six years, and I'm currently staying at one of the students' accommodation. Next slide, please. Thank you. So 
I could see many questions uh, in our chat box about should we wait or you know how to accept. So firstly, I would suggest do not wait. If you've got a scholarship, please go ahead and pay your deposit. You wouldn't want to miss this. Another thing is for a scholarship, university would contact you. If you receive a scholarship, it is you would mostly get it via a mail. So do not worry, patiently just wait. And it is not completely on academics. For me, it was my work experience as well. For you, it could be non-academic as well. And if you still, it has been long, and if you still haven't had any response, you could contact your regional office. They would surely help you in any way they can. Next slide, please. Yes, so this is a chart that I've made uh, of what expenses you could probably have and what is the solution for that. So as a student, when I came here, I'm still a student, but yes, traveling was very expensive. And for that, one of the biggest solution I saw was the Oyster card. As rightly mentioned by Gabrielle in the starting that we do get a 30% off on a student Oyster card. So make sure you get that once you land in London. For accommodation, Middlesex University provides university hall as well. We have five halls you could choose from depending on the location and what lifestyle you're looking out for. But at the same time, we also provide private accommodation, like a list of places where you could go and you could talk to and you could see what suits your need. Another major expense is the food. So our university, it does provide on-campus food. Like there is a food court where you would have big brands like Greg's or Subway where you could, you know, the food is at an affordable rate. You could also cook food. I would highly recommend that to cook food on your own because outside food is expensive. And there are also tie-ups with uh, Middlesex University, which is then the latest slide, like cost cutter, where you would find things at much cheaper rate once you show your um, student ID card. So there will be other expenses, miscellaneous expenses, which you would have to take care. So I would recommend if you have time, try to find a part-time job so that you could balance your expenses as well. And printing is very expensive here if I compare it with my home country, but thankfully university, we have free printing. So that's a great deal. Next slide, please. Yes, as I mentioned, Student uh, Oyster Card is a must. You would get 30% off. There are other tie-ups, for example, even at Coop, there are student discounts. So Coop is basically a grocery store where you would find everything right from your food to frozen food to fresh vegetables. So they do give a student discount. And you would also get discounts. I'm sure you would have heard about Tesco, Aldi, and little so these places to offer you student discounts so make sure when you come over when you land in london and you go for shopping make sure you carry your student id card and show it to them so that they can give you a student discount next slide please how to manage your finances grocery as i said food is one uh, thing which is important and which is which would be expensive. So these are the places which I found which are at an affordable rate. That is Tesco, Coop. Coop is just not. It is less than five minutes from my university. Aldi, Lidl's, and Poundland. These are top five places where you will be able to manage your entire um, food expense under probably three hundred pounds for the whole month. Next slide, please. So now I would give it to my uh, colleague, you, please take forward. Thank you so much. Thanks, Divya. So hi, everyone. This is Yu Hui. I'm from Malaysia and I'm final year student at Middlesex University. So I'm currently pursuing my BA business management in supply chain and logistic. So next slide, please. So I'm going to share some of my personal experience when paying the deposit as well as the tuition fee. So I myself would prefer to pay by um, over the bank transfer via the Western Union. So I believe that around a few might have heard of this Western Union. So international student and EU or UK student, they can now actually pay your own tuition fee using this platform that provided by Middlesex, powered by this Western Union. So this allow you or your parents to pay your fees in the currency of your own choice, then giving you a simple, quick and secure way to initiate the payment. So you should be aware that this is the only approved legit method for students to carry out a bank transfer. 
Next slide, please. So um, I do have some money saving tips as a student in London. So first of all, don't forget to budget. It is important to budget because budgeting can be the key when it comes to keeping tap on your own money. So you know exactly what's coming in and going out. So I do have a tip. So you can actually download all those budget planner app and then to help you to plan. Also, find out what can get you free. So when you are a student in the UK, there are some things that you don't have to pay for. For example, like, you know, you can actually get the medical prescription from the GP for free. So next slide, please. Save on your travel. I believe that Diva has mentioned that earlier. So get yourself a 16 to 25 real card and then link that with your Oyster card. And then you will be able to get a 33% of, you know, off travel from the, the tube. Also, also student discount. So you can actually register with the Uniday website or as well as the Student Bean website for more discount on those leisure and entertainment. Also, you will be able to get discount in hundreds of high street, high street shops, restaurant, theater, cinema, or other London attractions, for example, like London Eye and all this with a valid student ID. So do you have any question? Wonderful, thank you so much, ladies. All right, so I we do have several questions that I've collected on the chat and I will try and address as soon as possible um, or as quickly as possible. All right, so one of the questions is, and if you ladies want to um, answer them as well, just let me know. Um, are there any scholarships or discounts available for international students and undergraduates? Yes, there are scholarships and discounts available. Um, apart from the ones that we've discussed, I would say contact your regional office. Next question is, are there scholarships available for postgraduate international students? The answer is yes. So normally regional awards go from anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 pounds for international students, whether you're an undergrad or a postgrad student. Um, and you should contact your regional office to know how to apply. If you're a student, for example, from the Americas, that's North and South America and the Caribbean, then um, you can apply online on a form that we have on our website. Um, if you're a student from other parts of the world, there also should be a form out there. So please contact your regional office for that. Um, next question, from where can I access the information regarding scholarships for postgraduate international students? Well, the best and most forward, straightforward answer is from a webinar like this, um, but you can also, and this is why, what I advise to every student, reach out to your regional office because they would be the best people to know the scholarships that are available in your country, um, in your region, the scholarships that you can access. So make sure to contact your regional office as well. Um, and then also on our website, you can um, go to mdx.ac.uk um, and search for scholarships. And we have a, a web page that's specifically about scholarships, all types of scholarships. Um, next question is, what is the deadline to pay the deposit for international, or so, sorry, for the September intake? So the deadline to pay the deposit for the September intake will vary. Um, and this is a common question that I found out there on the, on the questions that we had here on the chat. Your deadline is normally three weeks or 21 days after um, you get an unconditional offer. And basically what we do is we hold a spot for you because we just made an unconditional offer, we hold a spot for you um, and we hold it for three weeks, right? And give you time to pay that deposit. If you don't pay the deposit in three weeks, that doesn't mean that your offer will be rejected or that it will be taken away. It just means that we will prioritize, you know, other students. We will hold it for other students. So you really want to pay within this three week time frame. Um, but if you need an extension, just contact your regional office, say, hey, I'm gonna need another week or two to sort out my finances or you know, to make up my mind before I um, make this deposit payment. Um, so yes, you should pay a deposit after receiving an unconditional offer letter. Now, if you're a UCAS student, you may not receive an unconditional offer letter right before. 
because a condition of your offer is to pay the deposit. So normally what will happen is you have a conditional offer, you firm your conditional offer, um, you are approved of all of the academic um, conditions of your offer, you meet all of the academic conditions of your offer, and if your only condition of your offer left is paying the deposit, then admissions will update your status to unconditional accept, and that's how you can then make the deposit online. Again, if you have any more questions or need specific one-to-one -one advice, reach out to your regional office, get them on the phone, um, allow them to um, explain everything for you. Um, next question, when will I know my scholarship amounts? Well, you first have to apply for that scholarship if applicable. Um, because some scholarships are automatic, like the ones that I mentioned for the EU or EEA. But if, you're, if you've applied for a scholarship, you should hear back in a specific time frame. Uh, normally it's within three weeks, but it can take a little bit longer at some times. You will either be sent an email with this scholarship amount information, like you've earned a 3,000 pound award or 5,000 pound award, um, or you will get an updated offer letter by email. So if you've applied and if you've applied to the scholarships and you get a random offer letter again, then that's why it's been updated with your um, scholarship amount. Next question, um, am I refundable? Is my deposit refundable if I am refused for a visa? Yes. Deposits are non-refundable with the exception of you know, if your, if your visa is refused. So only for that reason, if your visa is refused, then and only then are you able to get a refund of your deposit. Um, what you could do alternative is, again, speak to your regional office or to our visa advisor, see if you could be eligible to study in the next term or next year, and then just leave your deposit there because it will be applicable for the next cycle or the next entry term. Um, if that ever happens, just reach out to your regional office, say, hey, what are my options? How can I, um, what should I do? Should I get a refund? Should I just defer the application for next year? What are my chances to uh, getting a visa next year? So that's an option. Um, another question, if I've received a conditional offer and I have accepted it, do I have to pay the deposit amount after we received an unconditional offer letter? Yes, we don't take money where we don't take a deposit unless you've met all of the academic conditions of your offer. So let's say that you still have um, a few conditions, for example, um, to provide English language and you have a conditional offer, you firmed it, but you still have to provide that Eng English language test, then we don't take any money from you until you have showed us um, the certificate, the English certificate or the condition of your offer, and it's been approved. Only then are we able to um, move on to um, the deposit receipt. All right, another question that we have here. I have started my last year of bachelor's degree in January, 2022. When can I apply for a master's? and apply for available scholarships? This is a good question. Um, it seems to me that you've just started um, looking at Middlesex University as an option and you want to apply. Well, it will depend on which month of the year you will finish your bachelor's degree in order to apply for a master's. So for example, um, if you, we have two entry dates in the year and that's September for all of our programs, and then January for only a handful of our programs. So let's say that you, um, your last year of a bachelor's degree in January, 2022. So that means that you're already free from your bachelor's, you graduated and everything, you can apply for a September, 2022 start, and you should apply as soon as possible. Now, you don't need to have finished your bachelor's to apply, you can apply without having completed your bachelor's degree, but just make sure that by the time the master's degree starts, you will have finished completely, have a diploma, have your full transcripts. So that's what's important. Um, so yes, you can apply for a master's degree tonight. Um, I advise students to apply, especially if you need a visa, to apply um, a year to, 
at least six months before, because that will allow us enough time to process your application for you to process a visa and join us in time for the start in September, 2022. Um, so yeah, I hope I answered your question. Um, next question, oh, and the other part of your question is when can I apply for a scholarship? Remember, you have to first apply for the program. And once you get an offer from the program, then you apply for the scholarships. So whenever you get an offer, whether it's conditional or unconditional, then that's when you can apply for the scholarships, okay? For our scholarships, if you're applying for a Commonwealth scholarship or a achieving scholarship, then you want to follow those deadlines. Um, next question, are there funding Sorry. programs available? Um, may I ask me? Sorry? Okay, so are there um, funding programs available for international postgraduate students? Um, so there aren't federal loans or there aren't UK loans that you can apply for, but you can definitely apply for um, scholarships and bursaries and uh, regional awards at Middlesex. Um, when and how should I apply for visa? We have a whole webinar on visas for students that um, are in that stage. But just to give you a quick breakdown, first you have to apply for the university, then you apply for, um, then if you are granted an offer, an unconditional offer, and you have paid your deposit, then you apply for your visa with a unique code that we send you. We, the university as your sponsor, have to send you this unique code, and that's only when you're able to apply for a visa. So if you're worried about visas now without even applying, don't. There's no reason to worry about visas now. First, worry about applying to the university, then meeting the conditions of your offer, if any, um, paying your deposit, getting that unconditional offer, because only then are you able to start with the visa application. We walk students by the hand if necessary. We have teams that are able to give you immigration advice, immigration information that can help you we have webinars at that time. But to give you an idea for September starters, um, it's normally in the summer when they start applying for their visas. And so that's when the university um, gives those resources to apply for visas and, and help with that. Um, do you need to, this is a follow up question, do you need to be accepted to a university to apply for a visa? The answer is yes. You don't apply for the visa first for a UK visa and then apply for university. That's not the way. The correct way is you apply for the university first for your program, then you're given an offer, then you meet the, the, those qualifications, you pay a deposit, and that's basically when you when when you're sure that you're going to this specific university and to and you have a place in this program, only then are you able to apply for the visa. Okay, so that's a common question that students get, and thank you so much for that students ask, and thank you so much for asking. Um, so moving really quickly here, when should we expect a CAS after deposit payment? That's another good question. So universities are not able to send out CAS statements more than six months from the start of your program. So if, assuming that you've already have an unconditional offer, assuming that you already paid your deposit, you're just sitting, you know, waiting for that CAS, as a university, we're not able to send it any sooner than six months. So the sooner you will receive it is in March, but the university itself can say, you know what, we're maybe not ready to send it in March, so we're gonna send it in May, June, July, okay? So the university has that capacity as long as it's, no sooner than six months from the start of the program. Um, is there any possibility for getting student loans for international students? Yes, there is a possibility, but not in the UK. You're not gonna get UK student loans as an international student, but you may get student loans from your own country, from your home country. So for example, Canadian students are able to get um, provincial loans in their country, which they can um, apply and we are able to administer at Middlesex University. The same for USA students, they're able to get US federal loans or FAFSA loans and we're able to administer those in the UK. So check with in your home country what types of loans you can get, whether they're government loans, whether they are bank loans, um, and, and yes, you can apply them to, we are, you know, we are able to administer those loans. But as an international student, you will not be able to apply to UK loans, okay? 
Um, can postgraduate fees be paid in installments? Yes. International students pay a deposit and two installments. So you pay your deposit as soon as you get your, your as soon as you receive and accept your unconditional offer. And then you pay in two installments over the year. If you're a postgraduate student and a September starter, that would be the rule of thumb is at the end of September, that's the deadline of your first installment. You have to pay 50% of your tuition fees by the end of September and the remaining fees minus any scholarships or regional awards by the end of January. Specific dates vary every year, of course, and they're not on the top of my head, but it's normally that rule of thumb. A deposit when you get an unconditional offer, 50% um, of your tuition fees in September and the remaining fees minus any scholarships in January. All right, I just see. Um, some questions here, which I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to respond at this moment because we're running out of time. Um, let me see if there's any like last minute question that I can. So I have a question here about location. Um, which area is best to live in financially and safe near the university? This is a great thing. And this is why I love the fact that Middlesex University is located in a neighborhood, a suburban neighborhood called um, Hendon. And that is because um, our neighborhood is very affordable in comparison to, a center, to the center of London. So students are able to live in London, enjoy everything that London has to offer, but also we're located in an area where amenities like um, housing, right, rent is a lot more affordable. However, we're only doorsteps from central London. We're like 20 minutes into central London. So this is another reason why if you want, you know, you're thinking of, yes, I want to go to London, I want to study, but I also am financially, you know, aware that I have a budget to stick to. Middlesex is a great option. All right, so unfortunately, we cannot go through all of these wonderful questions that you have because we are running out of time. Um, but I wanna thank you so much. Um, I will see if um, our marketing team is able to give me a transcript of all of these questions and we can email you or we can send uh, those questions to the specific regional office so that they can email you the answers. So thank you so much for your questions. Thank you for sticking with us. Um, and, during this time and I hope this has been useful for you. All right, have a great day. Bye.